submit that as well. We won't have those changes otherwise. Uh, quiz one, available on Moodle, do 9 p.m. tomorrow. One uh, thing that I will mention again about the lab grading is that the auto grader for the various labs, it will report some score. That is always the minimum score that you will receive. So. Uh, partial credit can and often is awarded uh, if you have made uh, a good faith effort on parts of the lab that the auto grader is not giving you credit for, but whatever that, that automated test is, that's sort of a minimum for, for your swan lab. Kevin. Uh, I have a question about the So, when you submit stuff in the bar file, then you have to the it on bar, or do we just like? Uh, so the, the lab write-up uh, always will always describe exactly what you submit. The lab zero write-up, uh, that's the q.c file that you'll submit on Moodle. Uh, oh, one note, to, if you have been working on Mantis and you want to get a file from Mantis onto your local computer so that you can submit it, you can, from the list of files in VS Code, you can just drag that onto your desktop or into a folder and that will download it. Uh, for Mantis. So that's, that's pretty easy. Uh, any questions about the lab or uh, any of the uh, bitwise Boolean stuff we've been looking at? All right, let's start out with some practice. So the uh, plan for today, we're going to do some kind of review and practice with the, uh, the Ideas from uh, from Friday's class on bitwise and Boolean operators. Uh, my hope is this will help prepare you to start uh, the new lab out today, Lab One, where we will be solving a number of puzzles involving uh, bitwise and Boolean operators. Uh, and then we'll uh, move into an introduction to x86 64 assembly, uh, which will be kind of the, our focus for. Uh, uh, the next couple of weeks. So, here's our first problem. Uh, x is a char with a value of x41. Uh, what do we get when we have exclamation point, exclamation point, x? So, some votes for all four answers. So, it should be useful to discuss with your neighbors about how, uh, what is this exclamation point operator and, and what does it do? Some movement toward B, uh, it's excellent. That is what we will we'll get here. Uh, can someone uh, share how you thought uh, how you thought about how this is going to work? Huh? Oh, uh, so not anything is just going to be the value of zero. Uh, so like one exclamation point x would be O x O one, uh, and then like not zero is always interpreted as yeah, so uh, our when we have a Boolean operator, like our Boolean not, we always get a 0 or a 1 uh, based on whether it should be true or false. And as Connor said, anything that's not 0 gets treated as true. So when we do not true, we get false, which is zero, and then not false, we get true, which is one. Does that make sense? Kevin. So if we were to change that to like instead of zero at forty one, right? If we just go to zero at zero zero, then would it be zero at each of these Uh yes, if we did not zero, we get one. Is not false is true, and then we apply not again, not one, we give us zero. Yeah. So if, if x is zero, we get one. If x is anything that's not zero, or sorry, if, yeah, if x is zero, we get zero. If x is anything else, we get one. This uh, this will I expect to be a useful little trick 
on lab one, being able to take anything that's not zero and turn it into the number one and have that be distinguished from an input that was zero. All right, let's do one that involves our bitwise operator. So I have three different expressions here. Hex, uh, one out of a hexadecimal. Sometimes uh, you, you might see the, the letter digits capitalized. You might see them lowercase. That's simply a, a style thing that does not change the meaning of the number. So we have uh, hex AB and hex CD and applying are uh, different binary bitwise operators. And so we have three different results from these. And I'm asking you to identify which of these four outputs does not match the results from one of these three expressions. Uh, lots of folks thinking B. Uh, please work with your neighbors to, to figure out the results of each of these three expressions. Make sure you're feeling good about uh, these bitwise operators. Uh, also, one thing that may be useful, A, 1010, zero, one, zero, and then you can add one to that to get B, and add one to that to get C, and add one to that to get D, figure out what the eight bits of each of these are. All right, so work with your neighbors to, to finish through these. So lots of votes for B, that is excellent. That is the one that's not going to match any of these three. Uh, let's just talk about this. Uh, uh, let's at least go through the, the XOR example. Uh, so can someone uh, walk us through how you computed uh, A, B, XOR, C, D? Once you expand it out and you look at the two, if the inputs differ, then it's a one. If they don't, then it's a zero. Exactly. We take A, B, get those eight bits, take C, D, look at those bits, and now we're just looking for where they match, it's a zero, where they don't match, it's a one. And then we turn this back into hex, again, grouping by four digits, and it turns into six, six. So that would rule out uh, hex six, six as one that doesn't match. Does that make sense? Questions on this or, or the other expressions? Um, so the first time you did it, um, I mean, I, it's much faster than the way I was thinking about it, how, how you would convert to like decimal and then convert that to binary. But yeah, can you, can you talk about it? Yeah, so I think there's a temptation to look at this hex number and convert it to decimal, which is kind of annoying to do, and then to take the decimal and then figure out, okay, what is, what is binary, which is even more annoying. Um, and the reason why hex is so nice is that each of the 16 hex digits corresponds to a four-bit pattern. So we have zero, which is four zeros, one, and so on. And then A through F, also like A is 10. These are the four bits for 10, B is 11, these four bits for 11. And this is uh, what that um, uh, flippy bit in the attack of the hexadecimals game is all about practicing turning hex digits into uh, uh, the, the binary. And once we kind of know what each digit turns into, we can just kind of take each digit. So like B turns into its four bits, and then A turns into its four bits, and we have the eight bits of hex AB. And so the, the number that we see the common combining AB, so one zero one zero one zero one one, mm -hmm. would that just equal whatever the decimal that would be? Yeah, if we interpreted this as like an unsigned uh, integer, we would indeed get 171. Um. Yeah, but in this case, for these bitwise operations, we literally don't care about the decimal value. It has no effect on this. We just care about the, the binary. 
Uh, so we just never have to convert it to decimals sort of at, at any point. Other questions? All right, let's do another one of these. So now we're combining our, our bitwise and, and Boolean operators. Uh, so I have x and y, and I use them to compute this expression for z. And here I'm asking as a decimal number what the value of z will be uh, after we do this. That is a logical order. Right? Yes, yeah, these are, are two pipes. Important that this is a logical or not a bitwise or. Some votes for all the answers, so please discuss uh, with your neighbors kind of how you put together the pieces of, of this expression. All right, B or C are seem to be the contenders. This will be negative two. So let's go through it piece by piece. Uh, can someone tell me what we get uh, when we do not Y? Uh, zero. Exactly. Why zero? Because uh, anything that is not zero when it's not that value will give us zero. Exactly. Anything that's zero is true, not true is false. Uh, all right. Someone else give us uh, x, Boolean, or zero. Nick. One. That's going to give us one. Why one? Uh, Evaluate something that's going to evaluate to like true uh, zero. Exactly. We have non-zero, which is true or false. True or false, which is true. Uh, and last, bitwise not of uh, one. Osa. That's negative two because we're so we're because it's a bitwise negation. We're flipping all the bits. So then we have a bunch of ones and then a zero at the end, which is negative one minus one. Exactly. That we our one is all zeros, and then one of them we flip all of them, and we get all ones with a zero, and we know all ones is negative one, and this is one less than negative one because we're missing this last one. So we we also know that uh, to get a negative, if to negate this, we would do. Like negative one equals not one plus one using our formula, and we do a lot of algebra and figure out that not one is negative two. This makes sense. Questions on this problem? Anders. There's also I have something in our notes where there's a not operator that looks the same but switches one to zero and zero to one. You mean a, a, a tilde that does this? Yeah, or maybe that's just supposed to be multiple. Um, yeah, so the, the thing that switches between 0 and 1 would be the exclamation point. Uh, the tilde flips the, the bits, which wouldn't turn 0 in, into 1 unless you were just dealing with a single a single bit. So this turns a single bit from, from 0 to 1. But I think that's what I wrote down. Yeah. yeah. By doing that to each bit, it will, will change the overall value. Huh. So then, in this case, we just are <laughs> assuming as a baseline that there is like more bits than just like the one, because maybe we had on board earlier, so we're assuming more. Yeah. So this is, it's always important to know kind of how many bits we're dealing with. Is there any clue in this code that tells us how many bits we have? You see it. Yeah. So the end. And that specifies. Yeah, these things are of type int, which we know is four bytes. So we know these are all 32 bits. Um, so that when we have a one, it's actually 31 zeros and a one uh, in, the, in the last place. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I guess this is kind of fun, but. That means that it's always right? Uh, yes, yeah, so if I write char int long 
they're always signed, and you actually have to put unsigned in front of each of these types to get the unsigned version. Ask can you go over how you went from the bits to negative two? Uh, so this pattern, so I just, uh, I could kind of do all the math to turn these 32 bits into negative two, but I also know that negative one is all ones. Okay. Like, that's just a handy kind of fact to, to, to have in our brains, and so I can see that all ones with a zero then is like one less than negative one. Um, therefore, negative two alternatively can use the fact that this is sort of the formula to use bitwise negation to get negative one. It's like negative x is not x plus one. And then if I subtract one from both sides, I see that if I have not one, it will equal negative two. Right, two ways of of uh, getting to, to negative two without having to add up 31 different numbers. Other questions? All right. So there's one uh, last thing that I want to say about, about bitwise stuff. Um, uh, and that is... We have packing and extracting. This is one of the situations where this bitwise stuff gets practically applied. Um, and one way to think about this is uh, when we uh, mentioned this, this briefly very first day uh, of class, when we're representing a color, like a red, a green, and a blue value, often do that in hex because each color value ranges between 0 and 255. So each color value is just I mean, two hex digits or eight bits. But let's say I have an integer, some four byte chunk of memory that I want to use to represent a color. Um, but my So kind of the result that I want is some four by, uh, a four byte quantity that's going to have my color information. Uh, but my inputs are kind of three separate bytes, each of which has one of my three color values. And so in order to get them into this single variable, I have to kind of pack them in there. Or kind of different bytes of my four byte integer are just going to be used for actually like logically different quantities. And I can pack them in there using bit shifting. So I can say my red color, I'm going to kind of shift over to be the third byte of my integer. I've shifted over 16 places. So in the kind of four bytes of the integer, I'm kind of putting red in the third spot, kind of 16 bits into the number. And then I'll just bitwise or that with green shifted over eight. I put green in this second byte and or that with blue. And so by kind of taking each of these and shifting them over to where I want them within this int, and then using bitwise or, as I guess, why, like why is bitwise or, why can I use this to sort of combine these together in this way? But, so if, the shifting move over 16, everything that you're not working with will be zero. But what is the order means that yeah, if the zero comes into contact with one from elsewhere, it will change to one. So all the zeros count as like enough. 
Exactly. That when I shift over, I've shifted the red over and filled these in with zeros. And I shift the green over, or them together, all these zeros that were in the red get replaced with whatever was in the green. Uh, and then the zero down here gets replaced with what's in what's in the blue. Yeah. So like the you pass through char, or you pass through red as a char, right? And then you're gonna shift it to the left uh, 16 bits. Now that's bigger than char. Do you need to like say that this is an int or like cast it or anything to make this actually work? Um yeah, so uh, Uh, if I'm assigning this to my, my four byte integer, I believe the compiler will like figure it out. Um, if uh, if not, you would need to like it would just be uh, you passed each variable to an int as you go. I don't think you actually need to do that, but that would be a way to be kind of explicit on turning each of these kind of temporarily into four bytes so you can combine them. I see. Oh, I think it, I'm not sure about this other reading. Did it, another way to do it was without the ors instead of doing that, like anding it with o, like OXFF. I was wondering how that would work because it would accomplish the same thing. Yeah, so, so what, uh, this is why I was, uh, 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 so that's the extracting oh, okay. part. So like this sort of shifting, combining things together, that sort of packing things in. Uh, if I want to say extract the green, anyone have a suggestion on how I could do that? Like I'm given color and I want to get out of it just the green part. Okay. The mask. Yeah, can you say more about that? Yeah, like, um, no, the green is going to be like bits 16 through 8. Um, so you could just like and it with zeros uh, of the 16th bit, once to the 8th bit, and do it again. Like this? Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, a, a very important idea. Uh, as Nick said, it's called a mask, which is we have some pattern of bits, some of which are ones, some of which are zeros, and by applying a bitwise and, we basically keep whatever is in color that matches up with the ones and throw away, turn into zeros, anything, any, any of the bits where we have zeros. So applying this says, okay, I'm going to keep these sort of middle eight bits, and I'm going to turn into zero sort of everything else in color. Um, one way that I might tweak this is keep the mask uh, uh, just FF, and first say color right shifted by eight. So I would kind of take the green shift it down to the, the lowest eight bits, and then apply the mask to, to kind of zero out anything that was in the higher bits after the green. So shifted the green down by eight, that shifted the, that threw away the blue, and then the mask clears out the red, so we're left with just those eight bits from the bottom. Um, I just, how does, how does it mask the weight at the clear out. Um, so because color is an int yeah. and we end it with some quantity, this quantity will be interpreted as an int or will well, so if that's, it's, what, that's what we're ending it with. That's right. Yeah. We're ending it with hex FF and uh, it will basically this will be interpreted as having kind of zeros in all the places, kind of above, and all the leading zeros will be are uh, filled in. So we're in effect ending it with uh, 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 like six zeros and then FF. What's the So if we wanted, so so if we wanted 
the literal green value. Say that the green value was uh, uh, 52. If, uh, if we want to actually get 52, we have to do shifting at some point. Because otherwise, we're going to get 52 kind of multiplied by 2 to the 8 if we take it at, at, at this position in, in the end, because it has all these zeros to the right. So we need to like shift it down to actually get the value of, uh, of the green. So kind of whether you shift it and then mask with hex FF or mask with FF00 and then shift it 8, uh, I don't think that matters in general. Uh, in the puzzles you'll be doing for the lab, you'll be limited to uh, constants of at most eight bits. So you will need to, like you couldn't write down FF00 uh, for, for these particular puzzles. So that's why I'm kind of emphasizing this is, uh, as a standard way of approach. Other questions? Yeah. So yeah, um, I still don't get the 0x FF00 mask. Like, could you explain in more detail like, how that works? Yeah, so we have our kind of red, green, blue, unused byte. Uh, every two hex digits is eight bits or one byte. And so the mass 0, 0 at F sort of positions the ones to line up with the green. Those we won't change. Positions the zeros to get rid of the bits in blue and imply our zeros and the leading zeros. Uh, and so this mask will uh, keep whatever bits are in green and zero out everything else. OK, so if I want to get the blue, then I would do just FF? Exactly, yes. Just having, uh, and you wouldn't need to do any shifting at all in this case, just an FF would hit you the, the blue value. Kevin? Uh, does daylight like operation do the things in place? So, like, say, if you do color shift A gray, does that shift whatever is stored at color, or does it copy both? Uh, this returns like a new, it, this does not affect color. Like, the only way you change color is with an equal sign that involves color or a pointer to color. Other questions? All right, there are some problems uh, in the textbook that are listed as, as practice in the, in the notes for last time. I, uh, I'd recommend taking a look at those uh, uh, before getting started on the lab. Um, but that's uh, all I had for that sort of practice. Uh, so uh, the important uh, next step is to tell you about the first uh, US Vice President to resign. Um, only one of two who ever resigned. We have John Calhoun here and uh, Spiro Agnew in the 1970s. Only other Vice President resigned. Many have died in office. Um, uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, I think James, I don't remember Madison Monroe, but one of them had two vice presidents die and spent most of his two terms in office without a vice president because they, they just kept, they, they, they didn't stick around. Okay. Well, what's Calhoun's deal? Um, a sign of how kind of different politics were at this time, Calhoun was John Quincy Adams' vice president. Adams and Andrew Jackson were bitter, bitter political enemies, but when Jackson beat Adams, Calhoun stayed on as vice president and was then Jackson's vice president. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of, of Andrew Jackson and uh, kind of a, a picture of Calhoun from a little later in, in a portrait rather, a little later in his life. Um, so one of the, Calhoun was from South Carolina and an economic fact about the U.S. at this time was that uh, uh, the northern states had a lot of had a lot more manufacturing um, and uh, uh, didn't export a lot of agricultural goods, whereas southern states mainly exported agricultural goods and imported a lot of manufactured goods. 
Uh, so when the federal government wanted to raise the taxes, the tariff paid on imported uh, manufactured goods, uh, folks from the South, like Calhoun, uh, were really didn't like that. And South Carolina hated this so much that the uh, uh, political leaders in the state decided that uh, they would just refuse to obey uh, the federal law that they collect tariffs on the theory that states could nullify federal laws if they felt that they didn't like, basically if they decided the federal law was unconstitutional, which just meant that they, they didn't like it. Um, federal government was not happy that South Carolina was saying, no, we won't follow the law. Um, and so uh, uh, Congress passes a law that, saying, that says the president can use the military to enforce federal laws. Um, but also they passed a kind of amended tariff that South Carolina was OK with. South Carolina said, all right, we'll collect the tariff. Uh, and then symbolically said, but we nullify that law that said you could use troops to make us fall the law. Um, in the last few months of, of Jack, like Jackson and Calhoun, opposite sides of this issue uh, on this and, and others. So Calhoun was uh, uh, not going to be vice president in Jackson's second term anyway. But a few months left in his term, he resigns uh, to be elected senator from South Carolina. Um, and gets uh, gets replaced by uh, Martin Van Buren, uh, this guy, uh, who would uh, go on to be president after Jackson. Um, now, you may have heard of Calhoun before. He's kind of an infam infamous figure uh, in, uh, in US history. Uh, he became known as the Cast Iron Man because he, uh, I would uh, kind of steadfastly defend uh, states' rights. He uh, strongly believed that slavery was a positive good, um, and uh, you know the, the the country is clearly clearly headed for um, something about uh, uh, this this issue of states' rights and slavery is is not going away. Um, last, I just want to show this uh, picture of Martin Van Buren from uh, later in his life, uh, one of our our presidents with uh, uh, the most magnificent whiskers. Um, all right, that's our U.S. history. Uh, now I want to talk to you about uh, x86 assembly. Um, as I said, this is going to be uh, our focus for the next several weeks. And kind of up until this point, uh, we've covered kind of how, uh, how and where data is stored in memory, how numbers are represented in memory. Uh, and so starting today, we're going to be looking at how does the CPU actually execute your program? Like, what are the actual like operations a central processing unit does? Um, so let's go. Back to the very early days of computing. Uh, this was. Uh, this picture here is something called Colossus, a code-breaking machine developed during the Second World War. Uh, and like all first computers, this was manually programmed, which meant that there was just a huge bank of switches on the front of the machine, and you would turn them on or off. So you were basically programming in raw binary, switch up for one, switch down for zero. You were just like entering the program that way into the computer. And so the computer was running what's called machine code, just ones and zeros. And that's what kind of programmers were working in, too. Um, so you imagine machine code is not you know, the most approachable uh, representation for humans to work in. So uh, it didn't take too long before computer scientists came up with things called assembly languages, which were essentially just a text version of the machine code, just a human readable version of these ones and zeros to give kind of these individual instructions to, to the CPU. And we have uh, a tool called an assembler that would take the text assembly and turn it into the machine code, because that's still what, uh, what the computer system uh, actually operated on. Um, you know, again, over, over the years, uh, assembly, while an improvement on machine code, still not the most kind of human-friendly way. So, 
uh, folks who have invented what are called higher level languages, things like Java, C, Python, um, that kind of allow you to express computation and, and different things about the program in, in uh, kind of much more concise, higher level ways than the assembly. Uh, and we have a tool called a compiler, which takes our higher level language uh, and turns it into into assembly code, which is then given to the assembler to still turn into machine code. So at this point, you may be asking or wondering, well, Aaron, if computer scientists have gone through all this work to make these different layers of languages, create these high-level languages, why do we need to study assembly? Why can't we just stand on the shoulders of giants and just get on with our life? There are are, I assure you, good reasons to study assembly, and I want to mention a few of them here. So the first is that that step, the compiler, that's taking our C code and turning it into assembly code, uh, it's doing a bunch of optimizations. It's, it may uh, reorder uh, the, the, the way that operations happen. It may replace some operations with other equivalent ones. It may entirely remove op operations that, it, that the compiler determines are unnecessary or that won't have an effect. Um, and if the compiler is doing all these different transformations on our programs, it can actually be very important to understand what kinds of transformations those are and understand in what ways the structure of our high-level code affects which of these optimizations uh, the compiler could do. Uh, and so, particularly if we're interested in writing really fast code, being able to understand what the compiler is doing can be very important. It's also the case that while these higher level languages are much nicer to work in, they hide various details about how the program is behaving. One particular example is that the compiler, and you've seen this when I've done examples and said, in my role as the compiler, I decide that this piece of data will be stored at this address. There are cases where that information, like where is stuff stored, how is it moved, uh, is very important. For example, concurrent programs, those programs that kind of have multiple threads of execution, during, doing multiple things at the same time, these multiple things happening at the same time are communicating through data stored in memory. It may become very important for us to know exactly how the compiler is storing that data in order to write that code correctly and efficiently. And so being able to uh, understand at the level of the assembly the compiler is producing what's going on uh, uh, can be helpful there. Uh, the third one I'll mention is Understanding assembly is going to help us write more secure software. Uh, so as we'll see in lab three, where you will actually uh, implement several uh, uh, attacks on a vulnerable program, um, the ability to both make and prevent those attacks rests on a very detailed understanding of exactly how uh, function calls are occurring in assembly. And in general, a lot of kind of malware and security exploits rely on uh, low-level details uh, like the ones that we'll be uh, talking about the next few weeks. And so understanding them can, can help us uh, uh, prevent these kind of vulnerabilities. Um, yes, and kind of particularly understanding where certain information is stored uh, is critical. All right. So, I want to kind of build up, uh, uh, kind of extend our model, uh, our kind of mental model of the computer system uh, to include some of the ways that assembly is going to interact with the system. Uh, so, uh, so far, uh, we've been talking about a CPU. And this huge array of bytes that we call memory. And 
And we talked about kind of data kind of going to and from the CPU and memory. Um, and one thing that I want to remind you is that uh, memory here, it's just contiguous bytes. There's not kind of type information in memory. Uh, types are something that occur at the level of, of a program. Um, so there's other places to store data besides memory. And the one that we're going to be interested in today is actually part of the CPU itself. So as part of the CPU, there are these pieces of memory called registers. And uh, as a way of kind of explaining what registers are, I want to contrast them uh, with memory. So the basic idea is that registers are a small amount of data, a small amount of memory that the CPU can access extremely quickly. So the fact that the registers are literally part of the CPU is going to make them uh, uh, much, much faster to access than reading or writing data in memory. So uh, memory is pretty slow to access. And how slow is slow? You know, on the order of 100 nanoseconds, maybe less, maybe more. You may say, well, 100 nanoseconds, that sounds pretty fast. Well, registers less than one nanosecond to access data in a register. So we're talking about a factor of 100, at least, uh, difference here in terms of reading or writing data. Uh, memory's overall advantage is that it is big. Uh, I think this laptop here has, I think, eight gigabytes of, of memory. Um, but modern machines, you might find four and you up to, to 32. Uh, registers, extremely small. Uh, and this is not the entirety of registers that are on the CPU, but there's a particular set of them that we're going to focus on, which are there are just exactly 16 registers, and each one is 8 bytes in size. So then each register has enough to store an 8 byte pointer or an 8 byte long file. Um, and you said this is like an example of one, or this is uh, so the kind of caveat here with about this 16 is that there are 16 what are called general purpose registers that we're going to, to focus on and that the assembly we're going to deal with will basically interact exclusively with these 16 general purpose ones. But there are other specialized registers beyond these 16 that are part of the CPU. And those might have different sizes, different amounts of bytes per. Yeah, but uh, you might have some that are, yeah, 16, 16 bytes, but kind of not uh, like still like up on the order of a few bytes. Mm. Other questions? So another important difference is that how how do we refer to memory? Like what do we use to like name a spot in memory? What? An address. Yeah. Memory we use addresses. And like each of these eight uh, billion different bytes 
each has a different ID. Registers, we don't have numerical addresses. We have, they're all just names of registers. And uh, we'll go uh, there. There are, there's a chart in the textbook, and there, kind of, I will not expect you to memorize the names of all 16 of these registers. You'll always be able to look up this information. Um, but to just uh, give you a sense, the names all start with a percent sign. And they have names like percent. RIX, percent RDI, percent RSP, but they're basically all percent and then three letters, and these are kind of the specific names for uh, uh, each of these 16 different registers. And the last is memory. It is dynamic. We can, as the program is running, we can call malloc, increase the amount of memory our program has as it runs, free it up as we don't need it anymore. Our registers are static. There are 16 8-byte pieces of memory that are on the CPU. That's not changing. Or if it, or if it changes, something has gone terribly wrong. But those are, are, are completely fixed, so kind of every program is, is using these same, these same six registers, uh, 16 registers. All right. So like to put up a little bit of C code. Ah, yes. Yeah. So the other thing I should mention is that uh, the, the particular details about like what are these 16 registers, what are their names, what are the names for the different operations that we can perform uh, on a, a given CPU, these are defined by the architecture of that system. So uh, Intel and AMD, two companies that make CPUs, their CPUs use the x86 architecture. Um, and because this architecture defines kind of the set of operations, the set of instructions that a CPU understands how to execute, we call it the instruction set architecture. So as I said, we have kind of Intel and AMD, the x86 architecture. Uh, it was originally introduced in 1978. That was the 16-bit version. 1985, the 32-bit version came around. And uh, in just 2003, that's when the 64-bit version of this architecture uh, was released. Um, and this is kind of the instruction set that you'll see on kind of main, uh, mainstream personal computers. Um, uh, Matt, this is a little out of date. Like this MacBook is x86, but I'm sure there are uh, MacBooks in this, in this room or uh, that you use that are not x86, and I'll say a bit about that in a moment. Um, there's also the ARM instruction set architecture. You'll see this in... Uh, devices like the iPhone or, or iPad, the Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, it's a, a little more recent than, uh, than the x86. Uh, and then there's also MIPS, uh, which uh, is kind of not really used uh, uh, anymore, but was uh, used extensively for a while on things like Blu-ray players, older PlayStation systems, uh, things like this. And as far as the MacBooks, uh, we're going to focus on x86 in this course. Um, the new Apple M1 architecture is based on ARM. So they kind of took the ARM architecture and then created a kind of variation of it. Uh, they call it a, a, this is uh, some, some Apple marketing for you. I'm, I'm not being paid, sadly. Um, but they 
they built what they call a system on a chip, which is the CPU actually has a bunch of different components, uh, some of which are kind of traditional execute general purpose instructions, some are specialized to neural network type things, uh, some are about graphics processing, uh, and this is a kind of architecture design uh, that's, that's gaining in popularity. Um, so this is a, a, a chart of registers, uh, kind of what's, with, what's going on with these sub-registers and all these different names. I'll get into that later, but this is a chart that's from the, the textbook that we'll be referring back to quite a lot. Um, and just to kind of finish up, I want to put up this uh, piece of C code uh, that takes in uh, two uh, uh, pointers to uh, two longs, uh, pointers to eight byte integers. Um, what does this function do? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's fortunately like, appropriately named. It does swap the values that the two pointers refer to. So if we had uh, long x is 7, long y is 42, and then we call swap with the appropriate arguments. After swap returned, it could have switched it so that x actually stores 42 and y stores 7. How would we call swap? Like, what would the syntax be in order to have it actually switch the values of x and y? Exactly. You get a pointer to x, our long star. You can take the address of x and the same with y. So we basically give swap pointer x, pointer y, and it uses these and it uses these kind of change the value stored at x to be 42 and change the value of y stored at y to be 7. Does that make sense? Questions on this? So, as a preview of what we'll get into next time, there is a very useful uh, online tool. Let me make this text a little bigger. It's called godbolt.org. Uh, I think someone named Matthew Godbolt created it uh, and named it. Um, and you can give this tool some C code, like our swap function. And then you can have it show you exactly the assembly code that the compiler produces. And it will also color code the different parts so you can see kind of how the two match up. And uh, we have just a couple minutes. Um, but here we're seeing our kind of first instance of we have two different assembly instructions here we have the move MOV instruction that is, that is kind of shuffling data kind of to and from different places as the swap function needs. And then we also have the ret instruction, which you might imagine returns from a function. So we'll start next time uh, going through swap, talk about what's going on with these parentheses and not, and then launch from there into all sorts of things with assembly. So uh, I have office hours tomorrow evening, 7.30 to 9.30, in the Olin Computer Lab. So see you then or on Wednesday.